There are many words in our English language that have different meaning depending on when and how they are used. One of those words is love. Uh, the English word love really has several different meanings. There is love in marriage, which is different kind of love than what there is in a friendship. There's a love that parents have for their children, which is again different from either marriage or friendship, love. Uh, and <clears throat> there's a love that isn't only in personal relationships. We may love our new car or our house or whatever. We find the same to be true with the Hebrew language in the Old Testament. The word love is translated from uh, ahab, and it, uh, <clears throat> it means to love, like, or friend. And there, too, throughout the Old Testament, there was only one word, one Hebrew word that was used. Uh, we won't turn here, but in Genesis 24, 67, uh, it speaks of love in the marital relationship where uh, it, it's Isaac took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. In 1 Kings 11, 1, there was uh, King Solomon loved many foreign women. There's the example of parental love in Genesis 22, uh, verses 1 and 2, when, when Abraham was uh, told to sacrifice his son Isaac. Uh, and he said, then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the uh, land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. In the book of Ruth, we find there was love between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. In, -law. in uh, chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, and anyway, that uh, uh, they're speaking of, of Naomi here, uh, Ruth's mother-in-law, and it says, may he be, this is her son that she had, may he be a restorer to you of life and, of, and a nourishment of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better than the seven sons has borne him. So there again, it was just a, a family uh, love. In 1 Samuel 16, 21, it speaks of the love, the brotherly love that David and Jonathan had. That, uh, so David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and, uh, or, and he became his armor barrier. This was with David and Jonathan and with Saul. There's also a love in the Old Testament for non-personal objects. In Psalm 122, verse 6, this is a psalm of David that says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. And also in Proverbs 12, 1, it says, Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge. So it is a single word that was used in many different situations. God chose to preserve the New Testament in the Greek language. And originally it was written in Aramaic, Greek, and, and, and Hebrew. But if we would find, if we are fluent in Greek, that we would probably get a lot more out of the New Testament writings if we understood the Greek language because it was so rich in using a variety of words with very distinct meanings. Sometimes there is not a direct word in the English language to correspond with the, with the Greek word. We will find that there are several different unique Greek words with distinct meaning that are translated into the word love. And we are living in a society that doesn't begin to understand the various meanings of the word love or all that is encompassed in, in love. Without a clear understanding of the word love as found in the New Testament, we can be vulnerable to satanic deceptions too. Today let's look at three Greek words translated love in the English New Testament to help us grow in godly love so we can be more discerning of the actions and motives of people and not be deceived by a feigned love or love that is not genuine. There are several Greek words. There are only three that we will be looking at today that are translated love. The first is Strong's number 125. That's agapeo. And this is... Uh, to love in a social or moral sense. It is basically a social love. Uh, this is a love and concern for all people in general. Uh, a love for people we know, family and friends, and a love for people we don't know. 
This is basically common courtesy and respect. There can be emotion involved as we perhaps groan over the plight of people and, and situations that our people are in, but it is not, it's more a love of the mind, of the character, a sense of right and wrong than that of emotion. It is how we interact with people and how we treat people. All people have the capacity for agapeo love without being converted. Nearly all people on earth have agapeo love to one degree or another, and it would really be a hardened or messed up person that didn't have any. Uh, conversion is in, with God's Holy Spirit is not required to have agapeo love. The four gospel accounts are primarily the actions and teachings of Christ through his ministry, and agapeo love was primarily used during his ministry, but we need to consider that throughout his ministry, those people were yet, not yet converted. They did not have God's Holy Spirit, and they would not have understood agape love, as we'll touch on here uh, shortly. Uh, in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 46, Matthew 5, verses 43 through 46, Christ is speaking here. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It is agapeo here. It is this social love, again, a love that does not require God's Spirit or that anyone can have. But I say to you, love, agapeo, your enemies, Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. So we see here that agapeo love is a love that is taught, it is learned, and we all can be growing in. There are unconverted people that have a lot of agapeo love in this world. Uh, more agapeo love, if you look at our world in general, probably has existed among the Israelite nations than among the Gentile nations. It's just a little more the, the, the nature and character of the Israelite people. And it basically comes down to as long as Judeo-Christian values were taught and practiced in the societies, they have a considerable amount of agapeo love. Uh, unfortunately, since God has been tossed out more and more in our society, uh, the agapeo love has diminished accordingly or proportionately, in direct proportion. And, of course, the hatred that we have experienced in this country since the last presidential election is almost mind-blowing, but it's an example of the of the uh, agapeo, even a growing cold just because of the sins of, you know, of the people or the tossing out of God out of this nation. Political correctness has destroyed agapeo love considerably. Uh, and as we continue in the sermon, we will see that agapeo love is directly tied to the keeping of the commandments. Agapeo love means a focus on others rather than ourselves. The next word is agape, uh, and it is derived from agapeo, and it is a social love again, only it has an added ingredient. It's a plural word, and as we will see, that extra ingredient is the God factor. It is God's Holy Spirit, and that is God's love. Interestingly, the Bible is considered the best source of understanding what the word agape means. This is even among Greek scholars, non-religious Greek scholars. It is the Bible that they will turn to to try to understand what the word agape means because it was not really used in, in the Greek language. The third word, Greek word we'll look at for love is philio. That's strong, 5368. And it's, it is to be a friend to. Uh, it is to have affection for. Uh, it is, 
uh, filial love is definitely that of, of the emotion. There's a large emotion, emotional content in there. It is chiefly of the heart and not just a, a, of the head or of the, of the mind. The love we have for our family and friends, it involves emotion, feelings, and sentiment. And this love is of the heart. It would be a really tragic person in this world that has never experienced filial love or doesn't have any. And for those that remember the church in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, there definitely was more uh, in what we would consider the Philadelphia era or the era of brotherly love. And there was more filial love or brotherly love in the church. However, a lot of the people that we knew with a lot of filial love did not remain into the church and uh, it's re because the church required more than just having a filial love. And we will look more at filial love later uh, in this sermon. As we proceed through this sermon, we will see that God has agapeo, agape, and filial love. God has all three. We'll start looking more deeply into agapeo again, the social love, the social love that does not require God's spirit. Again, throughout the three and a half year ministry of Jesus, agape love or the godly love would not have been understood by the people. He was speaking to an unconverted people. His disciples were being called by God and God's Holy Spirit would have been with them, but not yet in them they would not have understood the full concepts of agape uh, love. And Jesus gives us a definition of agapeo love uh, and with the instructions there to be growing in it. If we turn to Matthew 19, beginning in verse 16. Matthew 19. It says, Now behold, one came to him and said, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said to them, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, this is agapeo, or social love and is involved, directly involved here in keeping the, the commandments. He's defining it as part, keeping the, the commandments. If we turn over to Matthew 22, beginning in verse 37. Matthew 22, <coughs> I'm, uh, yeah, verse 30, 37. It says, Jesus said to him, You shall love your God, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Again, both of these are the, the social love, the agapeo love. And we know that loving God first and loving our neighbor as ourselves is basically the keeping of the Ten, com the ten Commandments. And he is quoting here verses from the Old Testament books of the law, He's quoting Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, and, and Leviticus 9, 19, 18. And we'll turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and beginning in verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Old Testament, or the Old Covenant church, was being taught to know what, what as we know now, is agapeo love. Deuteronomy 6 beginning in verse 1, This is now the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your sons and your grandsons all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. 
You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The Old Covenant Church was commanded to and expected to be growing in what we would know then as agapeo love or this social love. And it comes down to keeping the commandments and obeying the laws of God. They were to grow and to learn uh, and, uh, and be learning and growing in the understanding of agapeo love. They were to teach their children agapeo love. Agapeo love, again, is not feelings, but is rather the character, uh, and we are to be growing, uh, the character we are to be growing in with God and with others, and in our relationships. We'll turn back to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> And of course, this is the, the giving of the Ten Commandments. And, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image in any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those that hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to, thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Again here, God is tying this love totally into commandment keeping and the love of God uh, is in, in the, with the commandment keeping and having the agapeo love for God. Of course, we know through history that the Israelites chose not to keep God's law and failed to be growing in agapeo love. Uh, just as in our world today, as the sin increased, the agapeo love decreased. And one of the reasons was that they did not have the agape or the God factor, the God's Holy Spirit, uh, available to them. As <coughs> the uh, agape love does require the presence of God's Spirit, as we will see. Agapeo love is all about our interactions with other people, people we know, people we don't know, treating people with dignity and respect, common courtesy, uh, something that is getting more and more difficult in the world where there is so much hatred. And Jesus went on to expand on this in Matthew 5, and we'll begin in verse 43. Matthew 5, verse 43. Here again from the Sermon on the Mount, he says, You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love, and here again, agapeo, or social love, your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the collect, uh, tax collectors do the same. So here he's expanding on the, the love uh, as, as Christ came to reveal the Father and also to expand on the law. It was the, one of the ways was expa expanding on, on the word love or agapeo in this case. If we turn over to Ephesians Five, beginning at verse 25, here's another area that's requiring agapeo love. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives. Again, this is agapeo. It is not romantic love. It is social love that Paul is telling the husbands here. Uh, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. 
So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. I think in marriage, women more naturally have an agapeo love for their husbands. It may not come quite as naturally uh, for men, uh, and especially in situations where if their fathers did not treat their mothers so well, or there wasn't a lot of agapeo love in, in the family. We learn from example, and agapeo love is learned from example, it is taught, but also very much from the example of others. And here Paul reminds the men to treat their wives with, their, with that social respect that is due to an equal child of God. We'll move on now to agape, and uh, this, of course, is the love with God. It's God's love. It is the addition of God in the picture or God's Holy Spirit. As we continue, we will find that the, in these scriptures that the words agapeo and agape are very intertwined and sometimes both used in the same uh, sentence. It can be a bit confusing. I'm going to try to make this as clear as, as possible as we go through. Um, you may want to just jot down that agapeo is social love without God, where agape is God's love or the addition of God's Holy Spirit. If you turn to 1 John 4, uh, verse 8, verse 4, 1 John 4, verse 8, we find here it says, He who does not love, and this is social love, does not know God, for God is love. And here it is, God is agape. So uh, here God is defined as being agape love or is defined as being love, but it is this agape love. That is God's whole character, his whole being. Uh, that is also repeated in verse 16. Uh, he has a love and a desire for all mankind. And of course we know in his plan that his that his desire is that none perish, that all will have eternal life. And his laws are agape love. Uh, they are for the benefit of all mankind. Turn over just to 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. 1 John 5, 3. And we see this, uh, for this is the love of God, and this is agape, or the godly love. This is godly love that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome or grievous. So love of God means that God is the source of, of uh, agape, love, agape love, and agape love is the keeping of the commandments. Keeping the commandments is one of the requirements for having and maintaining uh, that agape or godly love. We'll go back to uh, 1 John 4. And we'll begin in verse 7, just a page back, 1 John 4, 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another. Again, this is social love. For love, agape, or godly love, is of God, and everyone who loves social love is born of God and knows God. So here, again, this, this can be conf a little bit confusing, but it is the requirement is there that we are growing in the social love to ultimately have God's love. He who does not love, uh, social love, does not know God, again, for God is love, or God is agape, godly love. In this, the love of God, again, agape, the, the godly love, was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So agape love is of and from God. It is, it is both. And that is where it originates. The entire plan of salvation is based on this agape love or the godly love. Verse 10, in this love, agape or godly love, not that we uh, loved social love God, but that he social loved us and sent his son to be propitiation for our sins. So here it's also saying that God has a social love, agapeo love, for us. God has both. He has both agape and agapeo. That, uh, uh, 
verse 11, be loved, so let, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And in both cases, it is the social love, that God has the social love for us, as well as his, the godly love. Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time, but if we love one another, and this is social love, God abides in us or lives in us, and, uh, and, his, and his love has been perfected in us. And here it is, the perfection of godly love. Uh, verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So uh, our growing in agape love is growing in the spirit of God. Verse 14, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him and he in God. We have known and believed the love that God has for us. This is godly love. God is love, and he who abides uh, in love, in godly love, abides in God and God in him. So this agape love is God dwelling in us. God is the source and the only source of agape love. And basically, God's agape love is added to our own agapeo, or social love. Uh, it's, a, it's a combination of the two. It's the addition, again, it's the plural uh, uh, addition that, that we have available. We look back at verse 12, it says, No one has seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God <coughs> abides or dwells in us, and his love has been perfected in us. So be becoming perfect is a requirement also in growing in God's love, or in the agape love, or the godly love. Matthew 5, verse 48, Matthew 5, 48 Again, a verse from the Sermon on the Mount. He says, therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Again, here at the time that he gave the sermon, the audience would not have understood. They would not have had God's Holy Spirit available to them. They would not have understood the meaning of agape or the godly love. Uh, our becoming perfect is growing in agape uh, love to the point of perfection. And perfection requires developing the, the social love, or agapeo love, along with God's love, or agape love. And, of course, that is a lifetime process. Commandment keeping is a requirement for having godly love. Uh, 2 John, verse 6. 2 John, verse 6. This is love, and this is godly love, or agape love. Uh, love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning that you should walk uh, walk in it. And if we go back to 1 John chapter 2 beginning in verse 3 uh, 1, 1 John chapter 2 beginning in verse 3 it says now by this we know him uh, if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love, and this is godly love, or agape love of God, is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who uh, says he abides in him <coughs> uh, ought himself also to walk as he walked. Again, developing this godly love, or agape love, is a lifelong process. Uh, and a process where it's basically less and less about me and more about others. We'll go back to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, and we'll begin in verse 15. And again, keep in mind that at this point, the disciples did not have God's Holy Spirit directly. Uh, John 14, 15, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. This is social love. There's ag agapeo. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. 
I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you a little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day you uh, will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. Again, this is still social love. Uh, and he who loves me will be loved by the uh, will be loved by the Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Again, this love by the Father is the social love. Um, verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourselves to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he, we will come uh, to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and my word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And in each case, it is the social love that he is, is speaking here of, that it is a requirement that, that, that all grow in the social love. You'll find that the, the, uh, the keeping of the commandments is, is, or is, is a total requirement here in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 5. 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. <clears throat> Paul is writing here, he says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love. This is agape, or godly love. That the purpose of the Ten Commandments is godly love. From a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, or from faith unfeigned. I kind of prefer, as we get into things here later, the King James Version says faith unfeigned or not, not put on, not hypocritical. Uh, from which some have strayed, uh, having turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor which they affirm. So here we see again that, that the godly love is the keeping of the commandments. That is the whole purpose of the commandments is to be growing in this godly love or agape love. Romans uh, 13, verse 10. Uh, Romans 13, 10. Paul's writing to the Romans here. He says, love, and again, this is agape. This is godly love. Uh, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love, godly love, is the fulfillment of the law. So you cannot separate God's love or godly love from the keeping of the law or the keeping of the commandments. We know that <clears throat> the godly love or agape love is a fruit of God's spirit. If we turn to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, and beginning in verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love. Again, this is, this is agape love or godly love is the first fruit that's listed. Uh, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. One will not have agape or godly love without God's spirit. And if you look at the fruits that follow, they are all bound up in, in basically love is the first one because all the others are really combined and bound up in having that godly love. And, of course, godly love does not mean that we uh, are wimps or that we let people walk all over us. Uh, that as far as the goodness aspect of God's love, there are some surprising ways that, that, peop that goodness can, the fruit of goodness can show itself. And one of those examples of godly love and the fruit of, of goodness being in there, we'll go back to Numbers chapter 25, and this is one that the world today, with their understanding, would totally choke on. Numbers 25 will begin in verse 1. This is when the Israelites are still on their way towards the end of their 40 years of wandering. And verse 1, it says, Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to their sacrifices of their God, and, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. 
So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out of the, uh, in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brother and a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and he took a javelin in his hand and he went after the men, uh, man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her body so the plague was stopped among the children of Israel, and those who died in the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel, because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, Behold, uh, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after, he, uh, after him a covenant of everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God, and make atonement for the children of Israel. Here Phineas killed two people out of his love for God and out of his love for Israel. This was an act of goodness uh, that he did uh, perform. In our politically correct world today, the media would have Phineas so condemned and accused of all sorts of, of hate crimes. We are in such an upside-down world, and yet he was rewarded for his, his actions of being zealous for God. Uh, another example, there's an example of God's good, goodness in Romans chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 1, verses 1 through 4. Romans chapter 2. It says, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. For we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those uh, practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? So here it is, the goodness, of fruit of God's spirit, or of, of agape love that, that, uh, that leads us to repentance. And sometimes that involves some hard knocks along the way, and we tend to learn a lot of things the hard way. But... Uh, uh, we seem to often l learn more from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil than the, the tree of life. That's just human nature and being human. But it is God's goodness, it is God's agape love that will be bringing about uh, the other destruction of this world at the end of this age, too. The, the punishment on the nations, the punishment that is coming on this world, is actually a result of God's goodness or God's, God's love, God's godly love, or agape love. When we look at the use of the word agape, the history in the Bible, uh, when Jesus began his ministry, the term agape again would have been foreign to the people. And of course he came to reveal the Father and the understanding of agape or um, godly love. It is used very few times, that word is used very few times in the Gospels, especially in the early part of Jesus' ministry. And he did not elaborate on it until the last Pass evening of the last Passover. We'll find the very first use of the word uh, agape, or godly love, is in John 5, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 8, starting with verses 1 through 8. In John 5. And after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jews, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. 
when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Now we'll skip down to verse 16. Just, this is the event that occurred. In verse 16, it says, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So we'll continue in verse 39. Here, but he is speaking to the religious leaders uh, of, of that day and of that time that were accusing him because he healed this man on the Sabbath. So in John 5, 39, he says, you, sh you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know uh, you that you do not have the love of God in you. And here the word, this is the first use of the word uh, agape or godly love. And he is telling the religious leaders of his day that it is something they absolutely did not have. Um, he did define it here as the love of God. And they basically wouldn't have had a clue what he was talking about probably. Uh, similar account in Luke 11 verse 42 Luke eleven forty two, and he says, But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herb, and pass by justice and the love of God. Again, this is the agape, your godly love. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Again, he said that they, they totally were missing out on godly love or any understanding of godly love. It wasn't until the night of his last Passover that Jesus spoke of agape love uh, to the disciples. If we'll turn to John, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. And beginning in verse 31. Uh, so when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a while longer. Uh, you will seek me, and as I said to the Jews where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. This is still social love here, agapeo. As I have loved you, Okay, so Christ loved, this is social love again, the agapeo love that Christ had for them, that you also love one another. Again, this is the agapeo, or social love. Uh, by this we'll all know that you are my disciples if you have agape love for one another, or godly love. So this was the first use or occurrence of having that godly love. We'll continue in John chapter 15, verse 9. John 15, verse 9. Uh, Jesus is speaking here. He says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. In both of these cases, it is the social love. So it is the social love, the agapeo love that the Father has for the Son and the Son has for the Father. So again, that God has, uh, has both agape and agapeo. Um, Continuing on, he says, abide in my love, and this is godly love. So he's saying, as the Father loved me, and I also have loved you, abide in my godly love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my godly love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his godly love. So he is clearly defining that the um, agape is God's love, and that he is love and the Father is love. He's defining that clearly here to them. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you social love one another as I have social loved you. So he has, he's basically saying he has both the agapeo and agape love, or the social love and the godly love. Greater Godly love has no man than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. 
You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all these things I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. And we'll continue now. We'll turn over to John chapter 21, verse 15. Of course, this is after the resurrection and when he's uh, with, the, with the disciples. Uh, scriptures we're familiar with. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 15. He says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, or son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? This is social love. And Peter's response is, yes, Lord, you know that I, filio, or friendship, love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Joseph, Jonah, uh, do you social love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I, filio, or brotherly, love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. Then he said to him a third time, uh, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And this was actually filio. And Peter was grieved because he had asked him a third time, Do you, uh, uh, filio, or brotherly, love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I, filio, or brotherly, love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Peter was having a real struggle with agapeo love here because I think he had reached the point of realizing he didn't measure up where he should be or where he thought he should be in growing in social love. Uh, his relationship with Jesus had been that of a friend, of a buddy. They had, had traveled together. It definitely was a, a brotherly love um, relationship here but I think Peter is realizing that humanly we don't measure up in even in social love or agapeo love we can learn and develop human character but just like Old Testament Israel without God's Holy Spirit we don't quite make it or we're not going to make the make the grade we can't do it on our own we need God's Holy Spirit that extra ingredient in in the agape love uh, to really to be growing. We'll look now at, at filial love for a little bit. This is the friendship love, the brotherly love. Um, and we'll find too, here too that God also has filial love or brotherly love or the friendship love. Uh, in John chapter 5, verse 20. John 5, verse 20. <coughs> It says, for the Father loves the Son, and this is filial love, or brotherly love, and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may, that you may marvel. So the relationship between the Father and the Son includes this filial, filial or brotherly love, as well as the agapeo and agape love. Uh, it, uh, Next, uh, John chapter 16, verse 27. John chapter 16, verse 27. It says, For the Father himself loves, again, this is the filial or brotherly love, loves you because you have loved or filial loved me and believe that I came uh, forth from God. So God has this same friendship or affectionate brotherly love for us. That is the character of, of God that he has for us. Um, James chapter 2, verse 23. James 2, 23. Uh, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So Abraham was called literally a friend, a brotherly, this is the brotherly love or brotherly uh, relationship. Uh, of of God, uh, you won't don't turn here. But Second Chronicles twenty verse seven, it's speaking of Abraham. It says, "Are you not our God, who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever?" So in the Old Testament too, there was references of Abraham being a friend of God, and also in Isaiah forty one eight, we won't turn there, but it says, "But you, o, uh, Israel, are my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen." the descendant of Abraham, my friend. 
So again, there's this friendship relationship that God has. Um, so our relationship with God and with Christ should include this filial love. Uh, filial love, of course, should be a part of all marriages, including the ultimate marriage of the saints with Christ. Again, having been part of, of worldwide in the 60s and 70s, that definitely was an era of brotherly love or the Philadelphia church. Uh, there was a closeness and a fellowship that definitely seemed to fade as the Laodicean attitude grew more and more in the church. Uh, it, has, it was and still is easy to equate filial love with godly love in the ch church. And however, we have learned that there wasn't nearly the godly love among a lot of those people that we thought there were at that time. At, uh, we rather shocked at their motives in the, in the end. Um, we need to be very careful that we do not confuse brotherly kindness or what appears to be brotherly kindness with agape or godly love. And there are warnings about that in, in the uh, end, for the end time in particular. Um, at the beginning, it said, mentioned about having unfeigned uh, or unfeigned love or feigned love, the hypocritical love. In 1 Peter 1, verse 22, 1 Peter 1, verse 22, it says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere or unfeigned love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. And he's speaking the love here is, is social love. But the, uh, the point here is that if he's speaking of having unfeigned love, it means that there was an issue or there were times when there was a feigned or hypocritical love, that it was an issue in the church back then and something we can expect uh, today and in the, in the future. He's speaking of brotherly love without hypocrisy, which means that there were people there that were hypocritical, or there wasn't, at times he was encountering even elders that did not have sincere love. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 4. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulation, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, in, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by uh, kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere. Uh, love, uh, and this is again unfeigned love. King James, I think, I like the, the the use of the word unfeigned. I think it gives a little deeper meaning here, but it's unfeigned, and the love is godly love, agape love, or so uh, God's God's love. In turn over to chapter eleven of Second Corinthians, beginning in verse thirteen. <coughs> 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers are transform, transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, who its end will be according to their works. So he's warning the church then that was an issue then, it's been an issue through the ages of the false ministers in the church. And if we go over to Ephesians chapter 4, he elaborates on this with the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. Ephesians 4, 11, he says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. 
we, those of us that are a little older here, uh, remember when the heresies were introduced in the Worldwide Church of God, it was done with cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. Uh, it was done with a feigned love for the brethren. It was, the leaders were going to make it easier for the brethren. They didn't have to obey that harsh law anymore. Uh, it was a totally a feigned love or hypocritical love. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in godly love may grow up in all th uh, things unto him who is the uh, head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every, what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body of the edifying of itself in godly love. So it is godly love that, that builds up the church, that unifies the church into a strong body and does not tear it down or divide in any way. We'll go to uh, next to uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse, uh, beginning in verse 13. 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 13. Again, this is, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transformed him, uh, himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. There was a definite problem when Paul wrote this, that in the church at his time, and it's a problem that has definitely remained throughout history and that we have today, uh, we would, if we had an accurate history of the church of God, we would probably find that this to be true in every age, every era and every age of the New Testament church, that there were false ministers that presented themselves as being very righteous and very caring with feigned love. A few months after I came into the church, I had the opportunity to attend Ambassador College, and that, again, was definitely, I felt, was the Philadelphia era. And there were students that were very serving at every opportunity and seemed to have so much love for one another. Uh, but for many, it was, it was an act. Uh, they did not stick with the church. And today, some make comments like they never did believe anything that, was, that, that the church taught, that it, they'll even admit that it was just a, an act that they put on while they were there because it was the thing to do. I think in our society, a lot of salesmen are a fine example of feigned love. Uh, go car shopping and see how concerned they are for you that you just get the right vehicle perfect for you. Um, I've been to various health clubs at, uh, facilities and these, the ones, particularly the ones I call them spandex centers, the ones where the nice bodies are strutting around in their spandex, and you come in and you're a potential new member, and they are all over you, and they are so concerned for your health and getting you to join and what the exercise will do for you, and oh, by the way, we can set up training sessions for you, and uh, here, oh, there's supplements that'll just do wonders for your body, and once they've got you signed up, the next time you walk in, that strutting person in their spandex wouldn't give you the time of day. And uh, the, we have, unfortunately, there's been feigned love in the church or salesmen in the church. The first record we have of feigned love goes back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Genesis 3, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, Serpent, uh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows in the day that you eat it. Of it your eyes will be open, and you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. 
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, so also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. We are giving very, very few, almost no details of this event. I don't think the serpent just suddenly jumped out of the bush and said, hey, Eve, uh, did God say you can't eat of every tree in the garden? He would have used the same tools that have always been used by the trickery of men, cunning craftiness, deceitful plotting. We don't know when the conversation started or how long it lasted. How many times did the serpent appear to Eve before this event occurred? It doesn't say if this was a single event or if, if, he, uh, had, if there had been conversations, several conversations that had happened. Eve was totally inexperienced. She was totally naive. She would not have known what a lie or deceit was. And she had only heard God and Adam speak, and now she had a new friend that seemed so concerned for her. Uh, to Eve, it may have appeared that this serpent had concern for her and for her well-being. She had this new friend. Uh, you can know that Satan was grooming her. He would have schmoozed her every way that he could to gain her trust and get her to let her guard down uh, before discussing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, he also would have gotten her in the process to subtly doubt God or distrust God. You know, it's kind of the, hey, I'm your friend. I will look out for you. I'm concerned for you. I want to make sure you're getting a fair deal here uh, and make sure that God isn't keeping anything from you. You can know that all of those tactics would have been involved in, in this event, and it will be, I think, interesting in the future once we learn just how that all did transpire. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, he says, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, Experience says a lot of cunning craftiness has been used through feigned love or spiritual seduction. The elderly, the sick, and the widows are especially vulnerable uh, to feigned love of the brethren or of, of the ministry. Uh, some can be snared because they are confusing feigned brotherly love or even real brotherly love for agape or godly love. Brotherly love does not require God's Holy Spirit, and feigned love definitely does not. But there are some, especially the vulnerable, can be confused that, and snared by not understanding that brotherly love is not necessarily involved God in the picture. Matthew 24, verses 9 through 12. Matthew 24, verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. We, I think, tend to think of betrayal uh, is something that will happen in, in the, more happen in the future. Uh, and we tend to think of it as, hey, it'd be unconverted friends or relatives or neighbors or whatever that would turn us into authorities or, or some situation. However, if we look, really look, we were, uh, those that were in worldwide were betrayed by the leadership that was in worldwide at that time. And uh, it was, that definitely was not a single unique event of betrayal uh, in, that will happen. The, our younger people in the church would not remember the experiences that those of the older have gone through and again could be more vulnerable to the betrayal or to the deceit. Verse 11, then many false prophets will rise and deceive many. 
And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. This is agape, or godly love, that is speaking of here. So it's lawlessness. It, it works both ways. Lawlessness in this world, obviously, is, and we can see that as there's more lawlessness, that the love of this in our society is growing cold. But it's speaking directly here to the church. And it also means, evidently, that there's lawlessness within the church uh, that will lead to the godly love of many to grow that to ultimately grow cold. And it is speaking of godly love here, or those that are converted and have God's Holy Spirit. Our own disobedience can lead to our own godly love growing cold. And lawlessness of others in the church can lead to discouragement, to distrust, and to doubt. And we will have to learn not to blame God for pe what people do, no matter what their position or what the situation Let's go over to chapter 13 of, of uh, 1 Corinthians. And we'll wind down here with the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13. And this is speaking, this whole chapter is speaking of godly love. Um, it is a, a agape, or God, God's love, is used throughout this chapter, and basically Paul is defining it for us. At the love that we all need to be growing in. Uh, verse 1, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. One can be an eloquent speaker, but if the elements of, of godly love for the brethren isn't there, it can be an unpleasant noise for those that are listening, and I think we probably have all experienced that at one time or another. Uh, we have experienced arrogant speakers that what they say may be fine, but the attitude that's behind it can be very unpleasant or just be an unpleasant noise. Verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Uh, knowledge can puff up if not used properly. Uh, and sermons based on knowledge alone uh, <clears throat> have no real substance. The presence of God has to be there. That knowledge alone doesn't cut it. Verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Again, these things have to be done with the right motive. It's what's, what's the motive behind the giving or the serving or whatever that is being done. Verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Again here, what's the motives behind what we do? Uh, is everything that we do done in humility? Do we need to be the center of attention? Um, it says it does not parade itself. There are individuals that like to make grand entrances. Uh, I don't know if if any of you remember the, the movie Cleopatra, it's one grand entrance after another, after another throughout the entire movie. Um, just last week, I was at a flat track motorcycle race in Rapid City when I was back at the Sturgis Rally, and there were several elimination races for the, for the final race. And the last elimination race, the... Uh, fellow that won the race, there were, it was a very close with the, the first and second place riders, and he come roaring across that finishing line, and he wanted to show off, and he decided to do a wheelie, and he was going a little too fast, and he did that wheelie in front of the cameras, in front of, right smack in front of us in the grandstand, and he flipped that bike right over backwards. And he was probably doing about 60, 70 miles an hour at the time. And he went rolling, somehow wasn't hurt. But that bike went rolling, and there was exhaust system went this direction, and another piece went that direction, and he destroyed a $60,000 bike there showing off crossing the, the, the finish line. And not only that, they had the camera up there, the, the screen, and they did several replays <laughs> of it. And he was unhurt, and he had another bike to go into the final 
the final race, but they kind of interviewed each one individually, and he was rather embarrassed, to say the least, <laughs> when, before he went into the final race. Continuing on in verse 5, uh, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. Again here, it's all in, in motives of what we do. Uh, the concern for others by too many is a means of manipulating people for their own purposes or wanting a reputation of being so concerned uh, for others. We won't turn here, but I'll just throw in in Matthew 6, verses 3 and 4. Uh, in the, again, from the Sermon on the Mount, he says, But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deeds may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. It was kind of used to joke in, when I was in college about those that I have to go serve. And uh, Dunham said, hey, i got to go serve. <laughs> so... Verse 6, uh, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. And here again, do we mourn over the sins uh, of others, realizing the consequences it brings on ourselves and on others. Uh, verse 7, it bear, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Again, we're living in a very hate-filled world, and we need God's love to endure without getting angry or bitter, or full of hatred ourselves. It's just a difficult time that we are living in. Verse 8, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Of course, God's love is forever. It's God's, uh, God, God exists forever, and is, is, as he does his love. Verse 9, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect uh, has come, then that which is a part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know j just as I am also known. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Again, that the love is the godly love or agape love. We don't begin to grasp what the future holds, and we need to be growing in that both agapeo love and agape love, or God's love, and in brotherly love. We need to be growing in, in them all. So in wrapping up here, uh, agape, agapeo love, I'll just give some points. Basically, agapeo love is a social love for all people. It is something that is learned. Uh, we learn from direct teaching. We also learn from the examples of others. And I'm sure, and I know I have certainly learned qualities of agapeo or social love from unconverted coworkers and other people in this world, not necessarily just from people in the church. If, um, Agapeo, or social love, is not an emotion, and it should not be confused with brotherly love. All people with or without God's Holy Spirit can and should be growing in agapeo love. Agapeo love is directly tied to law-keeping. Um, and growing in agapeo love is a requirement for all people. The Old Testament church was an example that without the added ingredient of God's Holy Spirit, or without God's love, though, that we cannot achieve it on our own. It's something we will not achieve that perfection on our own. Agape love, or God's love, the godly love, uh, is agapeo love, or social love, with the addition of God's Holy Spirit. God is, his whole being is agape love or godly love. His whole being is love. God is the only source of agape love. Only people with God's Holy Spirit can have agape love. Commandment keeping and law keeping is a requirement for having and growing in agape love. And agape love, of course, is growing in the fruits of the Spirit. Filial love is love that involves emotion, 
Our filial love is primarily for people that we know and have relationships with. Filial love can be feigned, it can be hypocritical. And when filial love is feigned, or it is usually to manipulate or deceive, to deceive others and is a tool, can be used as a tool of Satan. We in the church are such a privileged few that have the godly love, the agape love available to us. <clears throat> As we go forward, let's be careful that we do not confuse godly love with filial love or brotherly love. Let's be cautious about being deceived by feign or hypocritical love that isn't real love. Let's ask God to help us understand and to grow in his love in a world that is filled with hate right now and deception. And as conditions get worse and worse, it will be a bigger battle for us uh, growing forward and continuing in God's love. And remember, it is God's love and his good pleasure to give us the kingdom.